five times five is? 45. Yeah. Hey folks, welcome, 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 welcome out there. It's math line time. Are you ready? Are you here? Are you watching? Are you tuned in? We're so glad to have you. I'm Ernie Roberts, and this is math line. You are not in the wrong place. You're where you want to be, right? This afternoon, a little jury outside. Gather around the TV. We'll try to brighten you up, all right? What do we do on math line, you may ask? Well, we talk about math. Well, we also work out a lot of math problems. That's the game plan. So how do we do this? You give us a call, 844-686-2378. We want to hear from you and bring a question with you. Bring a problem with us to work out together live on the air. And it's great. It's a great way to figure out what's going on. It's also a nice way to maybe get a little booster shot into your homework time. So be sure to give us a call again at 844-686-2378. And before we go anywhere further, let's go to that problem of the day. And the problem of the day says, find the standard form of the equation of the line passing through the point. Goodness. 4, negative 2, that runs parallel to the line 3x plus 4y equals 12. Again, that's 3x plus 4y equals 12. Where in the world do we begin? All right, let's take a look at this thing and see how we're going to work through it. Got, first of all, first of all, by the way, this is a standard form, all right, of an equation. This is the standard form. Basically, we want the final answer to have no fractions, for coefficients, and also we'd like to have that x, x part up here to be positive, leading the way, and also x and y together on the same side. Now you say, well, Ernie, what about y equals mx plus b? Well, that's slope-intercept form. We're going to use it to help us, but there are a lot of times where we see, especially when we start with systems equations, where we see these linear equations in that standard form as we work through trying to do maybe by elimination, even sometimes with some substitution involved. So you get the idea. We're going to worry about a little slope intercept form to be our intermediate step, but then we'll come back out to the final point there, all right? So just patience with us. All right, we're going to get there. So first things first, let's take that 3x plus 4y equals, and I'll get it right here, equals 12. And what we're going to do, we're going to get y by itself, all right? So let's work with that. We're going to subtract the 3x from both sides because it would be nice to know the slope. That's where we're going to start with here. So we're going to have a little subtraction going on here, and it looks like it's going to be 4y equaling a negative 3x plus 12. After that little messy mess there, it's still plus 12, still positive. Now, we want to do what? We're going to subtract? No, no, no. We're not going to really subtract anymore. We are now going to divide. Why? Because the 4 is hooked in by multiplication to that y. So let's divide everything through by 4. Don't leave anything out. Because if you do, it's got a problematic moment for you. Now, what's really important to us, remember, is... There's, there's that negative 3 fourths x. And then we're going to add plus 3. That's kind of nice on down the road. But what we're really concerned with is this little guy right here. That coefficient of x, that fraction there, that negative three-fourths, that is our slope. So what I want to go to is a, what I call the multi-purpose writing the equation of a straight line formula. Let's go to y minus y1 equals the slope times x minus x1. And folks, a lot of people wonder, where did that come from? Well, it basically came from the fact if we had slope equaling rise over run, and we put a 1 underneath that slope, that m, and we cross multiply, this is what we would come up with, all right? With the only exception, instead of putting y2 here and x2 here, we're just going to call it y and x, all right? And it's a nice, nice way, it's called the point-slope formula, and it's a nice way to get through these problems, I think, rather quickly. So what do we know? Well, we know m, we know it is a negative 3 fourths. We also know that the x1 point is what? Um, 4, so it would be x minus a 4. So we're going to our first x. By the way, that is, in case you're wondering, there's your x1, there's your y1, okay? I'm going to worry about y, <laughs> x2 and y2 because we don't have one, do we? We don't have any of those. So we're just going to play it out here. By the way, what do we got over here? We've got y minus, uh -huh, that negative 2 up there. So make sure we put a y minus a negative 2. Those two things got to come together. They are going to jam. We're going to get a plus out of that. Now, at this point, let's go ahead and put those little jam moments together. 
We can distribute this 3 fourths x minus, through the x minus 4 here, so let's do that. We've got a negative 3 fourths x, and we have plus 3, okay? And uh, do we have that? That's what we got going there, right? And over here we have what? Y plus 2 hanging on. And we want to get y by itself. So we're going to do that. We're going to subtract this 2. We'll subtract 2 over here. By the way, that minus 2 comes up there, and we get a plus 1. And I've got a negative 3 fourths x. And I have my y by itself here, working nicely there. And so there we have the different equation. Now notice, some of you are going like, Ernie, why did you use that negative 3 fourths? I uh, probably should have brought that out, shouldn't I? Well, there it is, parallel, the parallel business. What happens when we have lines that are parallel? We have what? The same slope involved. So here we have, aha, the same slope going on. That's what we're looking for. We also have different intercepts. This one has plus 3. This one has plus 1. So if you were to graph both of those, they would run side by side. And I, I, how do we get this to go here? In a negative type fashion, all right, both of them would have the negative 3 for slope. But there's one catch. There's one catch. We want standard form. Oh, boy. So we're fine here. We know that was good because that led us over to here, so to speak. Like I said, the slope was important to us, the negative 3 fourths. Now what we want to do is to, using this point, that we use that 4 and that negative 2 to guide us on through. And why do we use the same slope again, everybody? Because of the parallels. So let's do a quick maneuver here. Let's see what's going on. And we might, yeah, we got our um, bottom third dropped out. So there we go. Let's go back to what we ended up with. Nothing wrong with that slope intercept form, except it asks for a standard form. So no fractions first. So let's clean up this 4 right there. So we're going to multiply everything through by 4. Now what does that do? It's basically like saying 4 over 1 clicking through here. Well, that's going to give us 4y. That part looked easy, didn't it? Over here, we're going to say 4 also through everything. So we're going to take 4 times this negative 3 fourths. We're going to run it through here, and that's going to give us a negative 3x. You said, Ernie, how'd that happen? The 4s cancel. And then last but not least, the easy part, let's distribute that 1 times the 4, and we get plus 4. My friends, we're very, very close, aren't we? Oh, my goodness, how close are we? We are so close because all we have to do is move this 3x over, make it go positive, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So we're going to have 3x plus 4x equaling 2 4. And there's your final standard form. So we kind of zigged and zagged a little bit here. We went back here and then back over here. There you have it. That's your final tally. Right there is your story. Okay? And, oh, real quickly, does the point 4, negative 2 run through that thing? Let's find out. Put a 4 in there. Put a minus 2 there. I get 12. Minus 8 gives us 4. Even checks twice for us. And there's your problem of the day. All right? So, Let's get some phones ringing here. We got it, 844-686-2378. Uh, give us a call. Any ages, we are always welcoming young. We've rung those in the middle age. All those good things from adults to youth down to even our young, young, young ones. All right, so give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. 844-686-2378. Want to give a quick shout out to Lucas Hines, who uh, came by the studio today. We're going to be doing a really cool little special Friday show coming up sometime in the near future. We'll get a date for you here as the week progresses, hopefully. Um, See, so highlighting his elementary school, Kingston Elementary School, where I got to go back in the fall and visit. We're going to put together some good old stuff for them, and I think you'll have a good time watching the activity and the action of the Math Masters Club. But, Lucas, thanks for dropping by today, and thank you for the measurement. I, I want to call that just a mural kind of thing. It was a beautiful thing. Brought, and we'll put that up here on the air sometime here soon for everybody to see. But did a great, great, beautiful, um, I don't know what I call it. It's just a beautiful wall design type thing. So I appreciate you bringing that in today and also working with us today here at the studio. We will get that to you all very soon. But in the meantime, let's get some calls going, all right? 844-686-2378. That's our number. That's what we want to hear from you guys. It's a great afternoon to give us a call here, and let's work some math problems out together. Get the healthy, healthy folks out there, give us some calls, all right? 
And in the meantime, I understand we have a problem with the week that's going on on Facebook that we haven't really introduced to you guys yet. So let's take a look at this one. It says a cylindrical glass with a height of 15 centimeters. Wow. So we've got a cylinder with a height of 15 and a radius of 4. And now these are centimeters. So, well, that's nice. And we're going to fill it up with water. And we're going to pour it into a rectangular pan with dimensions of, so we've got a rectangular solid, a pan that has 5 centimeters for a, one of the dimensions, 15 centimeters, and 10 centimeters. So maybe think of whichever way you want to call it, deepness here. But there's your dimensions for that uh, the pan. It's a rectangular. It's not a square, but it's a rectangular. And the question is, will the pan overflow? So let's see how that's going to stack up here, what we need to do. We've got some dimensions. And folks, this is all about volume. This is all about the volume. Again, what do we do with these, these um, problems of the week? We give you a chance to work with them a day by day. So here we've got this four centimeter radius. What does that have to do with anything? It's a cylinder. It's like a tin can. And this is like good old baking pan there or something that you would just pour things in. And it just, it's just a nice rectangular solid look. So what we need to do is find the volume here, find the volume here, and then you'll be able to tell. Will the water, will the liquid overflow when we put it into this one? They say, Ernie, how do we find volume on these things? Well, Volume for a cylinder or a prisma solid, that kind of thing, is basically, it's simply the base area times the height. Now, in a cylinder, the base area, folks, it is a circle, circle. So, we're thinking of how do we do the area formula for a circle. So, and it, it really is pretty easy, isn't it? That would be our volume here. What about the volume over here? We're not going to give you everything. We're going to let you figure out some of this yourself, right? But that would be a circle, area of a circle times the height. We all know the area of a circle formula, right? Not take a look, look it up. And over here, basically, we're going to multiply your length times your width times your height of the rectangular solid. That will give us cubic units, by the way, on both of these. All right, These are square units for the base area. But when you add the height, you bring another dimension into play, and that's going to give you cubic centimeters when all is said and done. So we'll leave that with you tomorrow to get a little further on. We'll play with it a little bit more on the show tomorrow. But that's the starting point there. Some of you online are already working on it on Facebook, getting it rocking and rolling, okay? So be sure to take care of business on that. Those of you who are doing it on Facebook, those of you who are doing it here, this gets you a start. And, hey, you can chime in on the Facebook gang too, all right? They always welcome to have some folks liking us. And don't have to always have to already like the page to be able to like the problem. But we do like it when you love us and like us and share us on Facebook. So do so, and that'll get us rolling there. Speaking of rolling here, we'd love to hear some phone ringing, okay? 844-686-2378. And while we're waiting for those phones to ring, how about it? Let's look at a hay math line. Hey, math line. I'm Kaylee from fifth grade in Virginia. Here's my question. Can you calculate 287 divided by 25 and write the remainder as both a fraction and a decimal? Kaylee from Virginia. Also, that's taken care of up at Ripley's Aquarium, which we enjoyed getting to do that this past summer. We have got so many kids that we had questions and stuff from. We will probably keep, and some, even some adults, some young adults, some college students, what have you. But we're going to be bringing those in from time to time. So we enjoy them, and they've had a good time doing it with us. And the Stingrays were having a great time also in the background. But her question is, can you calculate 287 divided by mm -hmm, 25? And then we're going to do the remainder because she's right. There's a remainder as both a fraction and a decimal. Let's take a look at this one, all right? So first things first, when we say 20, 287 divided by 25, once you notice, that's what we're going to do. We're going to put the 25 right there and the 287 on the inside. And I have a lot of times where I have students that look at that and they'll say 25 divided by 287. Make sure, it's not necessarily because 287 is bigger, but it's just the order it comes in. Divided by tells us the 25 is going to the outside. So there's the first thing. 
Another way we can write this, I always mention to you guys that it's fractions are division. So we could also write it just like that, okay? And that is where we're coming up with this, oh, both as a fraction, and I think we're going to look at a mixed number, but we're just talking the remainder, right? What's left over? So I guess what we need to do is figure out, gee, what have we got left over? Well, let's take a look at this one. And Kaylee, thank you for giving us some numbers that weren't too incredibly crazy. And 25 is really kind of nice because we are going to get that decimal to work out nice as well as our fraction to come out pretty nice. So let's play it through, see where it's going to go. And I have 25 going into 287. It's going to give us one time there, 25. And you know what? I get 37 left over, which is going to work for me pretty nicely. Now, why did I get 37? First of all, I get subtracted, got a 3, and then we bring down the 7. Right there we go. Yes, sir. You got it, right? Now, let's take a look at our next little point here. We're going to put a 1 there. Why? Because that's about all 25 is going to do. If I do 25 times 2, I'm at 50. Too high, too big. So let's put a 1 right in there. And again, remember, we're multiplying through here. So 1 times 25. That picks us up with another, wow, 25 there. Subtract, and we're at 12. Now, I, I don't have anything else to bring down at this point. All right, at this point, I don't have anything else to bring down. However, I do have a remainder. And there it is. That remainder is 12. And we're going to put that thing over what we divided by. So here's your fraction part. Kaylee, here we go. You have 11, that's the big part there, all right? And we have a 25 in the denominator because that's what we're dividing by. What do we have left over? We have a 12. And that is your fraction form of the remainder right there. And that's what we're worried about is the remainder. We, we know it went in 11 times. You have like a mixed number type thing. So 12 out of 25. There's your remainder as a fraction. Now, let's play the decimal. Remember I said it will come out even. I promised you it would. Now, this time... We are going to go and say 25 divided into 12. And yes, 25 is bigger. But remember, that's what we're talking about. Forget about the 11. 11 doesn't count for us right now. We're looking at what's going on with 12 over 25. That's all we need to worry about. And we could have played the same game here. In fact, it's exactly like the same game. We're taking this 25 and dividing it into the 12. All right, you see that? So I'm just going to rewrite it over here and make it a little bit easier for us to, to play with. So I'm thinking about it. I know it won't go into 12. And I'll throw a zero in there and see what happens. Because that's how we're going to change from the fraction into the decimal. All right. And we got 120. Well, I do know. This is like having quarters, isn't it? So I do know if I have five quarters, I'm at $1.25. I'm over the I'm over the 12 -0 here. All right. If I have four quarters, I know it's a dollar. And I can put that under there and still subtract and life is good. So what I'm going to do, remember we didn't have anything here. So we are going to start with 120. We're going to put a four right there. Four times 25 gives us that, as I said, 100. Bring it down. Oh, subtract time. We got a 20. Good sign we have a 20 because we know we, don't, we, we want that number to be not obviously uh, bigger than 25 or equal to 25. That means we've made a mistake there. So bring down another zero. Let's go one more time here. So we're going to play with 200. And I tell you what, 25 going into 200, that's, let's start quarters again. That's an easy way to get these numbers to work for us, all right? And we said four makes a dollar. Guess what? Eight, double them, you're going to get two dollars, right? So let's put an eight right there. Again, eight times 25, that will give us the 200 there, and nothing left over. So we're basically done with the division. I told you it would come out even. Now, the question is, where is the decimal? And it was very critical that we put the 4 in the right place here to start with. If you put it over the 2, you got a problem. But the way it worked out here, we have our decimal going straight up there. So we could have 11, which we had, what, 12 25ths. That was the fraction form. Or 11 and 48 hundredths, and that would be your decimal form. And again, that comes back to the fact they are fractions. It's a decimal fraction. Remember I said 48 hundredths? It's a thaw on the end of it, all right? 
Here we had 12 25ths. All right, another thumb on the end thing. So you get the idea. That's, that's what we have. They're both fractions. Very good question. A lot of times we forget that decimals are also fractions. But Kaylee, thank you for that. And um, in Virginia, I hope you get to put this on YouTube and can tell your friends to watch us, all right? Now, we understand we have a, another caller waiting in the wing here. So welcome to Math Line this afternoon. Who am I talking with? This is for Ashley. Ashley, how are you doing? Good. And uh, where are you calling from? Uh, Knox County. Knox County. Great. What can I do for you this afternoon? We have a word problem. Okay. Uh oh, it sounds like a we. I like that. <laughs> 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 All right. What kind of word problem you've got for me? This is using what concept? It's a factoring trinomials. Factoring trinomials. Okay. All right. And so let's see. It is. It is a rectangle, rectangular swimming pool is okay. bordered by a concrete patio. Okay, hold on. Rectangular swimming pool. The width of the patio is the same on every side. Okay, all right. We'll have equal width around the pool, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And from there? The area... Yes, the area of the surface of the pool is equal to the area of the patio. Okay, so the area of the pool equals the surface area of the patio. So you're talking yes. about surface area in both cases here. Uh, mm -hmm. And then it, the question is, what is the width of the patio given these dimensions of the pool? Okay, and what are your dimensions of the pool? The pool is 16 feet by 24 feet. 16 by 24. All right. So here yep. we go. I'm going to go ahead. What I'm going to do, I'm going to draw a picture here of it, what's going on, because the picture helps a lot, I think. Uh, let's see. You've got 16. And we're going to, we're going to pretend these, this is not, <laughs> it, is a little bit, it is a little bit lopsided there, right? We'll go with the 16 here, and we'll put the 24 here. And you've got this, this little patio that's going around it, correct? Mm -hmm. And here's the deal. You know, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to run right through that, it looks like. You said it's equal width. I didn't do a good job of that, did I? But um, here we go. So this is like X and X, right? Because we don't know, mm -hmm. we do not know the width of it, right? Yeah. So what you're going to do here. Is and we did know the we do know the area here is how much um, twenty four times sixteen. Let me clear that out. Hold on just a second. We'll get the grapher on it. Uh, twenty four times sixteen because that's important. That's helpful. Three eighty four, right? Mm -hmm. And that's uh, square feet. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And according to this, it says the patio has the same surface area, correct? Mm -hmm. So here's where we're going to go with that. That means we've also got 384 square feet out there surrounding it. So put it together, what's the big rectangle here going to be worth? That's really where we're going here. And you're saying talking about factoring of trinomials. Let's see what's going to happen. I've got a 24 and I'm going to add what? X to both ends here, right? Mm -hmm. So that's 2X. My, my, What's going on out here is now I've got 24 plus 2x. You see that? Yep. And that's going to be my new rectangle width, okay, the big one, right? Mm -hmm. Now, go down. let's go in the vertical fashion. We've also got 2x adding to 16. You see where I'm going? Mm -hmm. And now what I'm going to do, that's going to give me all that area out there, which looks like, 384 times 2, and saving our time because we're running close on it here right now, I believe, and um, that's going to be 786. Now, at this point, what you probably would like to do, you may not want to, but I think you could, it would be good, is to go ahead and let's get these things multiplied together, do a foil fashion, all right? We know that we already have, this thing is 384, right? In other words, I'm going to go first, mm -hmm. follow where I'm going, outer, inner, and then last. 
So what's going to happen here, it looks like I'm going to have with the first, I've got this 384. In the um, outer, I feel like I've got 48x. Inner, I've got 32x. And I've got 4x squared equaling to 768. Now what we're going to do, we're going to need to set this thing equal to zero. And I'm going to go ahead and give you a hint. You can get a GCF of 4 to run through this, and that's going to make this thing a lot easier to work with. You see where I'm coming from on that? Yeah. And um, I'm going to tell you what, did you leave your phone number here? I was, we're, uh, we're about to run off the air here, and I can finish this up with you, um, or if you'll just hold, hold on there, they can get you back directed to the studio, okay? And we'll finish it up, and we'll finish it up live tomorrow, too. But anyway, folks, that's where it goes. So, actually, thank you for calling in on that. And we will finish that thing off. I believe we're going to get some good dimensions. And, hey, it gives you something to tune in for tomorrow, which means be there.